So good morning to everyone and welcome. I am really delighted uh, to introduce the first Europark webinar of the year, planning and designing hiking and cycling trails to minimize impact and relieve park management. By the high numbers of participants that I, uh, are, are entering still the room, uh, I really realize uh, that this is a sign of how relevant this uh, topic is. I hope we're going to meet uh, the high expectation created. We will try at least our best. This webinar is uh, brought to you by the Europark Federation in cooperation with INBA Europe. INBA is the International Mountain Bike Association. For those who are not um, acquainted with the Europark Federation, just to say that this is the oldest and largest network of protected areas in Europe, which includes national, regional, natural, and peri-urban parks, and marine protected areas. We count about 400 members from across 40 European countries. We are organized in eight sections, geographical sections, and have three main offices. The headquarters are located in Regensburg. We have an office in Brussels, and we have an office in Barcelona, kindly uh, offered by the Consular Natural Park, where I'm based. Our, our goal in Europark is to support protected areas managers in, in their work. And we do that through the promotion of uh, networking uh, activities, exchanges. And for that, uh, we organize uh, conferences, workshops, and webinars, uh, as the one we are bringing here today. We also have uh, working commissions. My name is Teresa Pastor, and I coordinate the Peri-Urban Parks Commissions. Commissions focus on specific uh, topics. It is in the nature of Europark uh, also to seek dialogue and the cooperation with other sectors uh, that uh, interact, affect uh, protected areas. So since uh, 2016, um, we have signed a memorandum of understanding with INOS, the European Network of Outdoors Sports, in order to better accommodate the practice of outdoors sports in protected areas. And it's in the, in, in, in the framework of this uh, cooperation that we are uh, participating together in an Erasmus uh, project, the CE project on sustainability and environmental education in outdoors sports. And as part of this project, uh, we conducted a survey among Europark uh, members in order to perceive how uh, protected area managers uh, were seeing uh, the practice of outdoor sports, the impacts of outdoor sports uh, that, um, that create in, in their areas. You can consult the result of this survey in, in, the, in the website of the project. There's a report. And uh, we also produce uh, individual fact sheets Pack sheets for each uh, of the of the sports analyzed. In total, we analyzed twenty sports. Of course, uh, regarding uh, hiking and biking activities, one of the issues that was really highlighted was the degradation of habitat, and especially uh, degradation and uh, erosion of uh, trails. In this project, we have uh, started dialogue with with Imba which is also participating. And this is why we decided to organize uh, this first webinar. So before we start, just uh, to remind you of three basic rules, this webinar is being recorded. So if you are not at ease with that, please uh, stop your video camera. After the webinar is finished, uh, the recording and presentations will be available in, in, on our website. Please do, you, uh, do write your name and institution in the name box so that we can better know you, especially because we would like you to write your questions and comments in the chat box. Uh, and there, uh, therefore, we would like to identify you. Only if time arose, uh, we will open mics. Our scope in this uh, webinar is not to open uh, big uh, discussions about how uh, some practitioners of mountain biking or hiking uh, behave. This, uh, the scope of this webinar is to be uh, uh, positive. We, 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 we want to, 
to focus on the on how from technique from the design we can improve the the situation it's, it's not a secret uh, that in uh, many parks especially per urban parks uh, mountain biking is not always well received they are blamed uh, for the degradation of, of the trails but uh, i really think that we should uh, also question ourselves if they are only uh, the ones to be blamed for that, or other recreational activities um, have also something to do, or even perhaps the design of trails is not good enough uh, to, to uh, avoid um, erosion. As in the, uh, uh, so it is in this spirit, spirit that we decided to, to, and we are delighted to invite Hans Stoops, who is a NATO CASI officer from INBA Europe, and he has a large experience in uh, sustainable trails, how to build them, has also experience and in recreational cycling and cycling tourism. Before working for INBA, he spent many years uh, working in Sweden for a cycling advocacy organization. So uh, I'm happy uh, to, to pass the floor to him and I'm really looking forward uh, to his speech. I will sure I stop sharing my screen so that Hans can share his. Please do the, the, your questions in the chat box. Thank you, Teresa. Let's see if I can get this to. Mm -hmm. All right, I hope everyone can see the screen. Thumbs up if it's good. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you. Yes, as Trace said, my name is Hans Stoops. I'm the advocacy officer at IMBA Europe. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the Europe Park Association for inviting us to speak at this webinar today. And I'd like to thank all the participants who've decided to spend time coming here to learn more about mountain biking and sustainable trails. Uh, during this presentation, I'm going to introduce our organization and uh, what we work with in Europe. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the basic sustainable trail principles that we work with in our organization. And I'll wrap things up by uh, giving you some tips about how to learn more about what I've been talking about today. A uh, little bit of background to uh, to mountain biking and to IMBA. Uh, mountain biking, uh, as we know it today, uh, started as an activity in California in the late 1970s, uh, but uh, caught on and spread all over the United States and the world uh, during the 1980s. Uh, this led to a situation in uh, 1988 where mountain bikers realized that they needed uh, representation to address their, their interests, and uh, the organization IMBA, the International Mountain Bike Association, was founded then uh, with a goal of spreading information about low-impact riding, how to work better with trails, and to collaborate with, with land managers and other activity, uh, other, other user groups. Uh, IMBA Europe uh, is associated with uh, IMBA in the United States. We were founded in 2012. We have a slightly different structure. We're uh, an umbrella organization uh, consisting of, uh, we have uh, 20 some, uh, 23, I believe, uh, national organizations representing uh, in our organization today, as well as uh, some uh, industry partners and uh, other kinds of associative uh, associate members in our organization. We're also a member of the European Network of Outdoor Sports, as Teresa mentioned before. Um, the entire goal of IMBA Europe is to be the, the leader in mountain bike advocacy. Uh, we like to see uh, more people on bikes because we believe that, that can contribute to better health, uh, climate, and economics, uh, especially for local communities uh, via mountain biking. Uh, we advocate easy access to sustainable mountain bike and shared use trails, both in places close to where people live uh, in population centers, but also out in the wilderness and in, in, in backcountry places where people can get a real kind of wild experience. And uh, we would like to see mountain biking in Europe uh, grow and, and be more diverse and to, to uh, work with the mountain bike communities within, within Europe. In short, uh, IMBA Europe wants to see more people on bikes uh, we believe that more people on bikes have societal and environmental benefits uh, that that can affect the entire planet, 
And we believe that the way to do that is to, to build better recreational infrastructure. So our organization is all about working with people and working with trails, making sure that there are more places for people to ride and that there are more people who have the opportunity to experience those trails. So today we're gonna to be talking a bit about sustainable trail building principles and strategies. And, <clears throat> you know, we have to ask ourselves if it's feasible to keep or even, even desirable to keep recreational visitors out of natural areas. And if it's not, then we need to understand how to best to, to regulate those visitors so that we can minimize the negative impacts that uh, those visitors have on the natural environment. Uh, we have to understand that a big part of the appeal for these recreational users visiting natural areas is the appreciation of the nature that's there. Uh, these visitors don't want to harm the nature, but they do need some guidance uh, in how to behave appropriately in the natural area. And that is the purpose of the trail. It's helping people to uh, behave appropriately in the natural area. That's the entire point of the trail. But we do have to ask ourselves, I think, to start off with, what is a trail? Because this is something that we don't necessarily all agree on. We don't have a common uh, language to describe what trails are. I think for a lot of mountain bikers, this would be an ideal trail. It's a what we call a single track in the mountain bike community, a very narrow trail uh, that allows you to get very close to nature and have uh, uh, an experience uh, that, that's as far from, from uh, built civilization as possible. Um, but there is a scale of, of, you know, what types of trails people use, uh, the types of users that are on those trails and, and the quality that's expected of those trails. Um, so that's something that we also need to recognize and understand when we're working together, uh, both in the recreational community and with land managers about what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about a trail. Um, you know, generally both among, among users and among managers, the understanding of what is required for uh, building and maintaining sustainable trails is, is not really well understood. There's kind of a, a lack of knowledge there. And this is something that we've been addressing in our DIRT project. This is the uh, uh, Developing Inter-European Resources for Trail Building Training Program. This is a, a project that got funding from Erasmus+. Plus. Um, I'll be telling you a little bit more about this later. It was a, a trans-European project working at many different levels. Uh, and as a result, we have a, a, a new trail building education that's available. But this is something we'll be, we'll be talking a little bit more later on. Um, I think we can all agree that this is a bad trail. Uh, it's not nice for visitors. Uh, visitors have come to this nature, er, nature area because they want to enjoy nature. They don't want to deal with the mud that's there, that's distracting and it's disturbing from their experience of, of nature. And it's of course, it's it's a problem for the land managers because this is a, a problem that's going to cost money to fix. Uh, you can see that they've already spent money trying to fix it with these planks. It's not a very effective solution because the planks didn't, there weren't enough of them and they didn't, they didn't quite cover it. It doesn't provide a good experience for the visitor and it provides a headache for the land manager. And a lot of trails that we have all over Europe kind of look like this anyways. And so it's worth reflecting over why they look like that. Um, in this case, we can say that this tra trail is in an area that's too low, uh, water will collect there, um, and it's always going to be wet as long as it's in a, in a low spot. So you have to kind of ask yourself why the trail was in this place in the first place. And that maybe the best solution to trying to address these, these problems is not to try to, to throw money at this particular trail, but rather to try to find a, a new uh, alignment, a new location for this trail that has a more sustainable, uh, that, that fulfills our sustainability principles better. Um, so the mountain bike community, uh, we, we can and we would love to help the land managers understand uh, the trail infrastructure. Uh, mountain bikers have a, a love of nature. This is something we all share. Uh, we have multiple surveys that show that the primary reason people enjoy mountain biking is to get closer to nature. Um, but we do have to think about trying to match the uh, type of a trail to the type of trail experience to the type of environment uh, that the trail is in to decrease 
the impact of the visitors and to uh, ease the, the management of the trail system. Um, when you're talking about the physical and environmental sustainability of a trail, it's, it's crucial to talk about erosion and uh, build trails that are erosion resistant. Uh, this will reduce the risk of, of maintenance costs and the social sustainability, ensuring that the trails minimize conflicts between users, that trails address all trail users' needs and aren't specific perhaps to certain uh, uh, trail groups, especially if they're designed as mixed use trails. So they're avoiding steps and, or stairs, for example. Um, and something that I don't wanna have to, to harp on about, but this is something we do still talk about today. Uh, you know, there's still a, among many people a misunderstanding and mis, mis, uh, perception that, that mountain bikes somehow cause uh, more erosion or more damage than, than hikers. This is something that's been proven false uh, time and again in multiple studies, uh, academic surveys. Uh, hiking and, and cycling both contribute to erosion in approximately the same way. Um, the both are uh, you know human powered endeavors uh, that of uh, locomotion along a trail, uh, causing friction uh, onto the trail, which is which is loosening soils. So this is something that we don't need to separate really the the concept, the activities in this case. Uh, both are leading to uh, uh, erosion. So <laughs> when you are working with trails, the best. The first thing that you need to do is you need to, to understand your location and you need to understand your users. And this is something you could theoretically try to do at least somewhat by the desk, but you're going to have to get out in the field at some point if you're going to want to do a, a, a proper survey to understand your location and, and the terrain and the topography and the environment and understand the users who are going to be using these trails. Um, one of the things we always advocate doing is, is going out and identifying positive and negative control points. Uh, positive control points are things that you want visitors to see. Uh, it could be, you know, a lookout point, uh, interesting geological features or, or species that, that are unique to an area. These kinds of things that people are coming to your area to see. These are, these are that you want them to see. These are positive, as well as uh, things such as, as existing infrastructure, bridges that might be useful to you, or uh, places for cultural rel relevance, like cafes, things that uh, are going to contribute to the positive experience of the visitor. Uh, take note of these, as well as, as note of what we call negative control points. These aren't necessarily always negative. We're, here we have, for example, a, a, a bird uh, nesting area uh, above. This is something that maybe is uh, a place that we'd like to have visitors avoid. We we don't want people there. We can call this a negative control point. Uh, industrial areas, uh, busy roads, things that are going to minimize the uh, the experience of the visitor. These are are negative control points. Uh, perhaps there's a a farmer who doesn't want you to come near his his property, for example. So you put these out on a map, and you can get a, a general idea of of what kind of area is gonna be appropriate for recreation and plan your trail network around those. So again, rather than you know, working with the existing legacy trails and, and, and the problems that they might, uh, they might raise, you know, think about the area in general and, and how to plan an area that, that addresses as many of the positive control points and, and as few of the negative control points as possible. Besides understanding your location, you also need to understand your users. You need to understand who's going to be coming and, and visiting your trails. Uh, what types of activities are they going to be doing? Uh, what are their ages? What are their skill levels? Uh, by talking with your, with your users, by, by having kind of an open dialogue uh, with the mountain biking and the hiking communities, you can better understand uh, what kinds of things are of interest to them, what sorts of things maybe are lacking in the the environment as it is today and and what sort of potential there is for for building infrastructure that addresses their particular needs and demands and we can say that you know when you build the appropriate type of infrastructure people will use that that's going to channel your visitors to uh you know where you want them to be here we have these are three uh they're strava heat maps this strava is a an activity tracking uh, uh, app that uses uh, GPS. And you can see the progression here from left to right as uh, an area 
uh, got a purpose-built mountain bike trail put in. You see, uh, before people were kind of all over this area using uh, using trails and roads all over the all over the place. Uh, by building the the mountain bike specific trail, you're able to concentrate users who will will flock to that and channel to that uh, infrastructure and and prioritize that infrastructure over over other things. So by building appropriate infrastructure that that meets the needs and interests of your of your user group, you're going to be able to channel users there and away from the places where you you don't want them to be. So let's talk a little bit about the trail itself. What sorts of things are we looking for when we're uh, talking about sustainable trails? Here we have a trail building project that we've worked on in the past. Um, a very simple equation to think about here. You know, uh, the relationship between the planning and the, the how the trail was built uh, and the visitors and water and how these all can contribute to erosion. Uh, there's not much one can do about water, especially with climate change. This is something that we're going to be seeing more. There's going to be, you know, more events of of of, of rain that's going to that cause uh, more erosion. Uh, and same with visitors. Maybe we can control visitors in some respect, but there's always going to be people there. But the the one thing that we do have control over that we can kind of uh, that we can steer is the planning of the trails themselves. If we want to minimize the erosion and the effect, uh, we can work on the planning of the trails to ensure that the visitors in the water do as little damage as possible. And so one of the things that we th talk about, you know, is is uh, the alignment of the trail. Uh, here we have what's called a fall line trail. It goes straight up and down a hillside. I'm sure many of you have something like this in your in your nearby local natural area. Um, this is the most effective way to go straight up the hill, but it also is uh, one of the, the route that water will take when it comes down the hill. And so any kind of use going up and down this trail is going to loosen the soil uh, on the trail surface. And as water comes down the hill, it's going to find uh, this path and accelerate along the path and take that uh, trail surface with it. Uh, that's going to run into your streams, it's going to, to pollute your water, and it's going to create deep ruts, which means that new users or subsequent users are probably going to try to find new routes up and down this hillside, uh, exacerbating the problem. So something you always want to try to do is avoid putting the trail in the fall line. Avoid trails that go straight up and down hillsides. Instead, you should try to put this trail perpendicular to the hillside. Um, uh, here we have uh, a hillside that has a 20% slope. The side slope is 20%. And the trail that's been put in has a slope of 8%. This respects what we call the, the half rule. Uh, this is a general guiding principle that the trail shouldn't exceed uh, half of the side slope gradient. And by doing so, water will sheet over the trail and uh, not, not, not land in the trail and take the trail surface away with it. You should also respect that uh, this. Uh, there's many other factors that come into the trail grade as well. Uh, different users or activities, for example, demand grades, uh, different trail grades. Uh, this 8% grade might respect the half rule, but might, by some users, uh, be too steep. Uh, might, it might cause high speeds or it might be too difficult to climb. So this is something that uh, is is so is uh, environmentally sustainable but might not necessarily be socially sustainable um another feature you can add to your trails to try to minimize the damage the water is ensure that water gets off of the trail are little dips we call them grade reversals uh this prevents water from from running continuously in the trail bed but then allows it to run off Really, I mean, all of these principles when we're talking about the, the physical sustainability are about getting the trail out of the water and getting water off of the trail. So the trail out of the water and the water off the trail is the is the is the name of the game. Uh, yeah, another example, just if this tree uh, has sensitive roots, rather than simply routing the trail over the, tr the, the roots, you can try to build up uh, with rocks uh to avoid uh to so that users don't necessarily have to tramp uh directly onto the roots ideally this trail should have probably gone uphill of the the tree but sometimes that's that's not possible but by by planning and and, and building a trail from these sustainability principles you can 
avoid the damage to the vegetation and ensure that visitors are led uh, along a sustainable route. These kind of techniques can also be used not just to address the physical sustainability, but also the social sustainability of, of a trail network. Um, here we have an old trail that was straight. Uh, straight trails are uh, kind of boring and they might uh, also encourage unsustainable act behavior. Uh, people might might uh, use them, uh, ride on them too fast, for example. By building these uh, chicanes and, and obstacles into the trail, we're uh, able to route the trail in a more interesting way, which is also going to be safer because people are going to take it at lower speeds. It's going to be more fun. It's going to look more natural. It's going to be a, a better experience for all users. So uh, so the trail building and design is not simply about, um, about the physical sustainability. It's also about the social sustainability and ensuring that the different users can use the network uh, at the same time. Uh, Another thing that's interesting to think about are the, the trail ratings. This is the International Trail Rating System. This was developed by one of our uh, member organizations. You can Google this and, and find out more about it. But this is kind of a, a uh, concentration of different trail rating systems that already exist in different parts of the world. But by understanding the rating system, you can uh, both communicate to your visitors what what they might be able to expect along this trail so that they don't get in over their heads. Um, but it also is useful for you as a land manager to understand what kind of trails you have in your facility, what kind of riders that's going to attract, and uh, maybe uh, develop trails that can complement the existing trails that you do have offerings that are appropriate for, for all users. So uh, learning more about the trail rating system could be very interesting for you from a sustainability standpoint as well. And uh, finally, I'd like to make a bit of a pitch and, and tell you a little bit more about how we're how to learn more about these uh, issues. If what you've uh, heard so far is is interesting, please do consider uh, booking a trail building school. This is an offering that IMBA Europe has. Uh, these are two day courses. We we will come to you wherever you are in Europe, and uh, typically it's a, a groups of about twenty to thirty people. We'll have uh, more in depth discussions about sustainability and how to uh, plan and design and build trails, uh, both in theory and in practice. So the first day is typically uh, an, an indoor day, and the second day is more of a, a physical day outdoors where we're actually putting what we've learned to practice. Um, and since we're in your uh, local environments, we're tailoring the course after what's important in your local environments. So if this is something that's interesting for you, please do not hesitate to, to scan the QR code or to follow that address in the bottom and uh, learn more about our trail building schools. Uh, the DIRT education uh, or, or program, uh, we've developed lots of resources. Some of the material that I've been presenting to you today comes from this project. Uh, we've also started a uh, technical trade school education in Norway. This is the first of its kind in Europe, an adult education uh, for training professional trail builders as part of this project. Uh, the original DIRT program has just uh, wrapped up in 2022, but we will be uh, pro prolonging this project uh, with a DIRT 2.0 uh, in the coming years. So if you'd like to learn more about DIRT and the resources that we've developed, please follow that link. And finally, uh, we have the annual campaign, Take Care of Your Trails. This is something uh, we do with local mountain bike clubs all over Europe every May at the beginning of the season. Uh, it just as a way to try to organize people and get them engaged in their local environment, ensure that their local trails are in good condition at the beginning of the season when people start riding, and uh, yeah, and 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 organize around a common cause of 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 mountain bikers taking care of of trails in their local environments. So if this is something that if you have a local club that you'd like to get engaged with, um, please do not hesitate to to uh, get in contact with us, and you'll find more. Uh, at this link here. That is all for me. I'd like to thank you for your attention during this presentation. And if you have any further questions or or you'd like to get in touch with me, please do not hesitate to send me an email or or call me up. That is mine for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans, for 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 your insight in this uh, 
uh, really uh, interesting and at the same time challenging uh, um, actions to do in for to uh, improve our um, trail system. Before I introduce the next speaker, I, I have two um, specific questions related to your speech, and then I will sure. all the comments that I've seen in the chat for the final discussions because they were not specific questions to you. So uh, you were saying that uh, sometimes what we need is not to put the, um, the trails in the part, but at some point, I mean, I'm talking from ignorance, at some point you will need to lower. I mean, you cannot always uh, put everything uh, higher. So you said because uh, when it's low is when the water tends to accumulate. Yeah. What uh, is the solution to that? Yeah, of course, Anytime you're going to cross uh, a, a stream, for example, you're going to have to at some point go to a low point. Uh, every trail system is going to have places where you have to go to a lower point. And in that case, uh, the best course of action is to figure out where you can go over a low point and make those lowest impact. So finding a place where you can make a crossing that uh, where it's where it's narrow, for example, or doesn't have as much uh, using existing infrastructure, like existing bridges as much as possible. And if that's not possible, uh, using, uh, you know, local stone and local materials to build up a bed that allows you to traverse a wet area without uh, getting in the mud. This is a this is mm -hmm. something that you'd prefer to building a kind of, you know, plank uh, bridge like you like was uh, shown in that picture. OK, also, you are talking about like redoing. Okay. Replanning, redo trails, and and somehow, uh, what did you suggest we should do with the old legacy of trails? Should we close them? Because while for me, what I see is a risk is to increase fragmentation. I mean, the more um, trails we have, uh, this will flood the, yeah. the landscape, and and uh, we have uh, a. Uh, a lot of legacy trails can actually be quite good. It, you know, these the things that I've been talking about today are not. They're not uh, techniques that IMBA has developed. A lot of them are techniques that are a concentration of, of knowledge that's been developed for you know thousands of years. Romans built uh, roads basically according to these principles that we talk about. So this is not really anything new. Um, and a lot of legacy trails do uh, exhibit a lot of the kind of sustainable principles that we, we talk about. Uh, what you do need to do uh, is, is, you know, do a survey of your trail network and find out where the problems are find out what kinds of it's you know if you have a, a a 20 kilometers of trail it's it's likely there's just a few hundred meters of the trail that are actually really problematic identify those areas figure out what's actually the root cause of the problems and then figure out how to address it then um you know, this is not always going to be possible to simply, you know, patch the the existing network, but sometimes that is, and it's at least, it'll at least, you'll have a better understanding of what's causing the root cause of your trail problems, rather than uh, simply trying to, to patch it every time. Okay, so my last question, uh, it would be, you didn't mention at all, uh, how this would cost, how, how a normal, uh, just to have an idea, you know, protected areas are not, or they don't dispose always a uh, big budget. Right. And uh, that's why I would like to- There are lots of different more. models for planning and building new trails. Uh, you can use, uh, if you have uh, trained and skilled volunteers, you know, oftentimes uh, mountain bikers are very interested in, in getting engaged and, and helping out with these kinds of things. So that's, that's one route to take. Uh, so engaging with the local community for, for support. Uh, otherwise, you can try to find grants or find other ways of, of financing uh, work done by professionals. But uh, there really is no solid straight answer for what trails like this are going to cost because it really depends on the level of uh, uh, investment and in, in the, the, the type of train that we're working with. Um, you also have to address, you know, how many people are you expecting to, to, to visit this trail? Is it going to be a thousand people a year or is it going to be 75,000 people a year? Uh, that makes a huge difference into the kind of uh, interventions that you need to use to, to build a sustainable trail. And it also maybe will change uh, the budget. If you're going to have 75,000 people a year visiting the trail, maybe there can be money uh, to be found somewhere to address those concerns. 
Thank you so much. I mean, the fact that you have said that how much uh, cooperation is important, uh, give me the way to pass to the following uh, speaker, because uh, this is what they have been doing uh, in Greece. I'm going to share my screen for a second so uh, I can put the presentation. Um, can you see it? Can you see it? Yep, we can see it. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm very glad to introduce uh, now George Survinus, who is the president of the Elenin uh, Mountain Bike Association. Uh, George uh, Survinus uh, has worked uh, and cooperated together with the mountain, the Multimetus Aesthetic uh, Forest in, in Athens, that in fact we visited uh, last week, and believe it or not, it was raining in Athens. Um, the director of this park, uh, very visited uh, park, uh, Peruvian park in, in just outside Athens, is the chairman of the Peruvian Parks uh, Commission. Please, George, uh, you, you, the floor is yours. So you can hear me now? Yeah? You can hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Perfect, perfect. So uh, thank you on my part for inviting me uh, to speak to this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, to begin with, I would like to present the idea of what we do here. Uh, so in 2012, a group of people uh, that used to ride bikes decided that we should form maybe an official party so we can uh, communicate with different authorities, different forest departments, so as to promote the whole idea of mountain biking in Greece. Okay, and uh, as a result, uh, we had the Hellenic Mountain Bike Association. It's a non-profitable club that uh, has the idea of promoting mountain biking, uh, building communication with official public parties and bodies, and uh, also establish the behavior, the guidelines, of how we behave with other users of the mountain, which was a lot more important than it sounds now, back in the days there. And we had also some trail building seminars with IMBA back in 2012 in, an, in the mountain of Parnitha near Athens. And like everything in Greece, things were not easy uh, in the beginning. Uh, so we were talking about the mountain of Hemetus. Okay? Uh, some some geek information about uh, the mountain of Imetus. It's uh, a mountain that's 20 kilometers long and uh, 1,026 or 27 meters height. And it's divided in the middle by a canyon. The interesting thing about the mountain of Imetus is uh, the name itself. Uh, the name comes from a Prehellenic vocabulary. So it means that it was habitated and known to the people many years before the Greek history we know now. So it was a lot before than uh, Plato, Aristotle, all the people that you've heard about. We are talking about 2000, 2000, 5000 years before Christ. Okay. And uh, in the ancient Greek time, it was an important part of the city. It had a small river that used to start from the mountain and went up to the center of the city of Athens. Today, if you go, you went there, Teresa, in uh, the place, you can find traces and trails that used to be the river bed of that river. And in the same river, they used to have also some kinds of festivities during that time. It used to be the small mysteries of Eleusis. If you know the big mysteries, uh, it was like a preparation for them uh, in, uh, in a place near the center of the city, near the river beds of the river. Year by year, the city of Athens expanded. And uh, more and more houses used to be built uh, up to the uh, top of the mountain. Not at the top, but up to the mountain of uh, Hymetus. During the Middle Ages, the name used to be Trelos, uh, which in Greek means the crazy one, but it was a paraphrasing of the French phrase Trelong, which means very long. That's why they used to call it Trelos. Uh, nowadays, it's the mountain closest to the center of the city. We're talking about 20 minutes, 15 minutes driving from the city of Athens. And uh, this is why it's full of people, especially during the weekends. Uh, we are talking about mountain bikers. We are talking about uh, walkers, trail runners, 
people that just grab their coffee and go to the mountain with their friends once per month uh, to enjoy the nature. This thing, uh, the traffic of the mountain, made like apparent some, I don't want to call them problems because they have like a negative idea, but some conflicts between the users of the mountain. And uh, this became a lot more apparent during the pandemic season. Uh, here in Greek, we had a lockdown and uh, for a lot of time, the only things that you were allowed to do is actually go to the mountains, go to the nature. Uh, so more and more people started coming in a very small area of Imetus, the aesthetic forest, as you called it before. And uh, so the first conflict started. Uh, we are talking about, how can I say? If you have to coexist with uh, a lot of people inside a small area, then problems will occur. Okay, so the people that used to walk in the trails, they had like, uh, they didn't want mountain bikers to be there, some of them. And also we had uh, some phenomena like uh, uh, rocks inside the trails that there were not before. And uh, one time, that was the scariest one, one guy found a rope in the height of the bicycles passing uh, between two trees. So it was like a trap for people who ride bikes or motorbikes. Uh, I don't know. But uh, these problems existed also. So we had to find a solution for that. Okay, we had to coexist with the users of the mountain, but also establish ourselves as a community there because mountain bikers are a big number of people in, uh, in the mountains, especially Himetus. Uh, if you, everybody knows Strava, I think. If you can see the Strava results from certain trails in Himetus, you can see even like 400, 300 passages every weekend in one trail. We're not, not talking about 400 mountain bikers. Maybe one can do it like two or three times but you can understand the number of people visiting the place there. So we had a lot more problems than that. Uh, another one was the lack of legislation, a total lack of legislation for, uh, for mountain biking trails. Uh, I think since we formed in 2012, the first official legislation that actually presented the idea of having mountain biking trails was in 2017. Maybe something like that. Also, we have the lack of uh, of the forest department in in Greece in general, but in Athens mostly, because especially after the crisis of two thousand and twelve, uh, more and more forest forest departments started to we can say collapse. Uh, I remember that uh, I used to go to the forest department of Parnitha. It was a place, a big, very big mountain near the center of the city in 2012. I went back there in 2019 during the coronavirus and the place was really empty. We we're talking about empty offices, no employees, no cars, nothing. So we, we can say that they're not present in the mountains there. And, and also we had the problems of the negativity. More and more people didn't know what mountain biking was about. They thought that, uh, okay, you can do it in the, like in the fire road. So you don't actually need mountain biking trails. And it was, it was a lack of knowledge. People that actually never had this kind of uh, conversations between bikers. So they didn't really know what it was. And uh, the nature of the sport, as Hans told you before, demands a certain kind of trails. Okay, so we had to build our own trails or we had to form the existing ones in a more sustainable way. Okay, so the solution to that was, I think the key word is cooperation. Uh, the first thing we did in 2012 uh, relating to the mountain of Imetus was uh, uh, getting in contact with uh, Philodasiki Union of, Union of Athens. As you said before, Nikos Pangas 
it's a member of uh, Philodasiki. And to be honest, they were the first people that actually realized that mountain biking is a sport with certain needs and belongs to the mountain. So they were the first ones to actually help us uh, form an existing trail into a mountain biking trail that had inside the features that every mountain biker knows. We are talking about berms, jumps, rollers, and everything was in uh, with the same mindset of sustainability. And it was the first time, I think, in Greece that uh, we managed to gather in a total of three days, we had almost 200 people coming and helping uh, forming this, uh, this trail. And you could see also people of every age, uh, small kids with their parents, uh, people that used to ride bikes since uh, the 90s, and it was the first time for them that something like that happened. So it was, I think it was the highlight uh, of our club. It was the first year also. It was very important for us that we managed to do something. Uh, and to be honest, it, it didn't stop there. But uh, since then, we still don't have the presentation we want in the forest departments. Uh, we're still waiting for uh, uh, authorization about the trails. We're still waiting for uh, uh, allowance to have our own signs. Signs that uh, in, in the, uh, uh, to, to just to inform people about the trail, the length of the trail, how difficult it would be, maybe some features that are inside. So we are not still uh, in that line. And we had to find solutions to be more present in the mountains. So as you see in the, in the photo, we tried to uh, form better relations uh, with the users of the mountain by helping them doing certain things. So uh, one of that could be like um, cleaning the trails from, uh, from natural disasters. In last year in Greece, in Athens especially, we had a big snow. And uh, the result was for uh, when the snow melted, uh, every trail was unapproachable. Not for us, only the mountain bikers, but for uh, people who used to do walk there also. So we had, again, to uh, cooperate with uh, Philodasiki and the walkers uh, in Imitos, and we cleaned the trails, as you can see in the photos there. We had also to... Uh, uh, be in touch with uh, other like official bodies in Imitos and uh, clean the mountain from uh, litters. Uh, if you saw the picture before, if you can go one picture back, you could see how many bags of litters we managed to collect. And it was, I think, nothing compared to what you can find also now in Imitos. Uh, the idea was to to have an official in the beginning, an official uh, difference between the mountain biking trails and the hikers trails. Okay, and that was the difficult, uh, the difficult part. Uh, because as is normal, the walkers wanted to have their own trails without having the fear of uh, having a bicycle behind behind them or uh, passing by trails that have certain features like jumps, berms. And for the walker, these things are a little scary. Okay, so it's understandable, but we had also to have our own trails. And uh, the idea now in Himetus is uh, to have a big form of trails that include also mountain biking trails. And um, in the prototypes of uh, the European Association. And uh, we're still waiting, to be honest, for this to happen. And uh, I hope that in the next five to six months, we will have a result that we want because the mountain of Imetus, it's near the center of the city and it can be like a prime example of how a mountain near the city should be with uh, the trails of the hikers, the trails of the mountain bikers, uh, easy ones, difficult ones, uh, trails for the kids. We have all these ideas that they might be, might be for, but we're still waiting uh, for that. What I wanted to note 
is that um, the idea to make things go further in this kind of uh, situations is uh, cooperation. I mean, uh, in the end, if you don't find, if you don't form an official club, and if you don't find another official body of users of the mountain, of forest department, of municipalities, everything, then you cannot actually uh, manage to make like a normal mountain biking form of trails. Okay, and that's why we, we have to actually be always in contact with the forest departments, with Philodasiki Union of Athens, uh, with the workers uh, to promote this idea. Thank you so much, uh, George, uh, for your uh, testimony. Of course, cooperation is key. We, uh, you have a uh, show, uh, show it. Um, I have uh, had participated in, in different uh, meetings and some words that has come uh, several uh, times is um, co-design, co-participation, co-management. This is a desire of, of the outdoors sports sector in general. I have two direct questions to you, George, before we, we pass uh, to, the, to the chat. You said that your option would be to segregate trails so one for hikers, another one for bikers. Uh, do you think this is always possible? Do you think also about legal issues, uh, this is, uh, is uh, uh, legal? I mean, in your country, there are some countries that you have the right to pass everywhere. I mean, and then- Yes. The, of to do. the official legislation says that you cannot actually ban anybody from the mountain. I mean, if we are talking about legal users, not motorbikes, not mm -hmm. ATVs, not this yeah, kind yes. of mm -hmm. uh, The idea was to have an official like uh, differentiation between the trails, so as the walkers know that, okay, I can go inside there, inside a mountain bike trail, but there will be signs inside that inform me that you should pay attention to this passage because a mountain biker can come. Oh. Okay. So it, he would know that, okay, yeah. there is a jump yeah. there, maybe a bicycle with like 20, 25 kilometers of speed will come at me, so I would better be mm -hmm. careful. Or in the difficult mm -hmm. parts to have like a sideline to go around, so she will have to not to, to avoid uh, that trail. No, the legislation says that she cannot ban anyone from the mountain. But if this is, this is where I was talking about contact with other uh, users. If everybody that represents a the users of the mountain make an agreement of how we behave to one another, then you don't actually need the legislation. Okay. So that was the idea in the beginning. Um, yes, I've seen in the chat, in fact, a, a comment uh, that we need dialogues with bikers, but this is not always easy. We will discuss about that. Uh, you also were mentioning uh, that, yeah, you would like to put your own signs. I mean, what, who, is, um, who is not allowing uh, to do this? Is the management authority? Because also it was this uh, made me think that if everyone, every association wants to put their own signs, you could end up with a mountain, plenty of full signs. So, so for me, I will really need to cooperate with the management authority uh, to somehow um, unify uh, the signing. Yeah. The idea is not to have our own signs everywhere, is to be in contact with the other users and maybe have mm -hmm. like uh, signs that says, okay, this is a mountain biking trail, this is a walker's trail. And with the same colors, the same uh, material, the same everything without impacting the nature. Uh, so it's not just putting our signs in every place of the mountain, but uh, with, um, and with communication with other users. The number one part, I think, I'm not sure, is the forest department. So usually it's what the forest department says. And if they don't actually proceed with that, then we cannot do nothing. Thank you. Thank you so much, George, for, for, for your uh, contribution here to, to, to this uh, webinar. I have a question for Hans. How do you see, see these, um, these two things that uh, George mentioned, the segregation and the signal, uh, signaletic in the part? Yeah. Uh... Segregation is one of those issues that it's kind of always coming up as to whether uh, it's it's a valuable uh, tactic or not. 
Uh, I believe that in, there are places where segregation probably is uh, a, the best solution, generally in places where there are uh, a lot of users, you know, particularly in, in near to uh, population centers or in uh, natural areas that, that receive a lot of visitors, uh, segregation might be the, the best option. Op oftentimes, it might be hard to do that because you can't justify putting in parallel trail networks or people are going to want to explore the other trail network uh, with whatever you know means that they they themselves are are using. So it, it's going to be hard to uh, enforce in a lot of places. But again, perhaps there are places that where there are a lot of visitors where it's really the best strategy. The other thing that you could think about is how to deal with uh, or or that that mountain bikers and hikers don't have that high of a difference in speed, especially on uphill sections. Uh, so there are maybe certain areas where uh, a specific mountain bike trail uh, would be advantageous, uh, but where users can share the rest of the trail network. So uh, a specific mountain bike trail for a descent, but a shared climb, that's something that, that might be a, a valuable option in certain places. As far as signage, uh, again, that's very much based upon local regulations and, and uh, uh and, and and traditions uh signage is is a great way of of helping people to navigate and communicating to all users so we believe that signage is a, is a great uh tool but again it's something that that is very <laughs> place specific and and is hard to mm -hmm. necessarily implement uh if you have a, a multiple thousand mile kilometer long uh, a trail network it might be very difficult to to ensure that every corner is, is signposted and things like that so it uh it is very location dependent okay so i have a question from from the chat to you uh hans uh question is about how uh you can design trails so that uh the impact uh to wildlife is diminished do you have any technique or you have anything parameters you take with it? for that one one of the issues that that you see with uh with wildlife disturbance is the need to uh for wildlife to have you know large congruous areas that they're working on and so by by building trails that channel uh visitors you're hopefully going to minimize the uh, uh the division of of these large uh continuous areas that are important for the wildlife habitat so simply channeling visitors can be a great technique uh identifying areas that are important habitats that you don't want to have visitors in and trying to exclude those you know with the control points as i was saying in the very beginning mm -hmm. is another strategy or by having trails that that might have seasonal use uh perhaps an area is known as a as a bird uh, hatching zone and so closing uh the trail during the season when that is uh important uh could be a, an option or having an, an area where uh for example night night mountain biking uh is an activity that can cause disturbance to wildlife um if there are places where where like i live in sweden and it's it's dark half of the year so if uh, people want to mountain bike in in the winter times it's they're probably going to have lights on their bike and they're probably going to be doing it at night uh because night is so long having specific designated areas where that's uh acceptable is is kind of the best option then so that uh wildlife does have large habitat areas to roam and not be disturbed at nighttime uh but that there are still designated areas where where the activity is permitted okay there are several questions regarding uh the bikers that go off trail and somehow open new trails. What would be a uh, recommendation from, from, from you both, from Imba, uh, to managers, how to deal with this problem, how, how to approach about the bikers in order to, to avoid uh, this uh, opening of trails? Do you have a I mean, recommendation? Deep yeah. That? Yes. I, I'm... When I first began, I mean, having contact with mountain bikers, I realized that you cannot represent everyone. That it's not your responsibility. I mean, you want to do it, you want to have as many people as possible to have to follow the mindset that you have, but you cannot do it. So sometimes people will do their own thing. If you can manage to present the whole idea, the big picture, as we say, and uh, make it obvious that if we follow certain rules, then maybe we have a good result, then it's good. 
but not a lot of people will understand that. Uh, I I have in mind something like I told you before about behavior between one another. That if if us as a community, mountain bikers, will not have certain unofficial legislation between us, then somebody else will like force their legislation to us. So this is the idea. If they can understand mm -hmm. that, that if we follow certain rules and mindset, and then we have a good outcome, then I think most of them will stop having their idea as the main one. Because people want to make trails to have fun. Okay, they don't do it for bad reasons. They don't want to hurt nature. They don't want to uh, have conflict with uh, the other users. They just want to have something different. So if you present them the idea that if you follow a certain mindset, you can achieve that without being in conflict with others, then I think this is the way. But it will not be easy, not for everybody. I'd like to add that this is not a specific problem between mountain bikers and land management community. This is an issue for all types of recreational users uh, that, that land managers have, have problems with, right? There's issues not just going off trail, but there's people who uh, start fires uh, in places where they're not allowed to have fires, people who go with their dogs off leash in places where the dog is not allowed <laughs> to be off leash. You know, these are, there's always going to be outliers in the community who are not uh, obeying the rules. And then this is something that then this is a general challenge for land managers is how to address that community how do you reach out to those people and you know there's lots of strategies with signposting and using social media you know there's there's different strategies but i think uh it's it's not terribly helpful to isolate this as a problem with mountain bikers going off piste and rather addressing how can we talk to uh our recreational users in general about things that we'd rather they didn't do yes okay i see <laughs> I, I understand your point. You don't want to be the only ones to be blamed. It's true there are many other problems, uh, especially in pre-rural parts. We, we get all that you have mentioned. Uh, um, but somehow, uh, from protected area managers and sector, we 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 are we like to to um, focus and and to to deep this dialogue that I consider. At least Europark has started with with you, uh, with uh, other sports representatives, and particularly with uh, with, with Imba, in order to to work more on that. We all realize that uh, many things are, are done uh, are needed, especially uh, we have the from the protected area uh, management point of view. We sometimes have the feeling that uh, bikers and hikers as well, eh? and and the people with the uh, with the dogs don't really and graphs uh, the consequences of the impacts. And it is perhaps it's a failure right, from the protected area work, uh, sector that we failed to communicate on that. So I'm really, really, really glad that, that we have opened this, I, thought, I hope, uh, long uh, and fruitful uh, dialogue. Uh, and this is the, the very first webinar that we are doing on that. Uh, our idea from Grow Park is to, to organize a face-to-face -face, uh, workshop at some point. Uh, bringing together both communities and, and really uh, focusing on, on, on these uh, particular issues and problems and, and, and to have um, a yeah, dialogue uh, and seek for solutions, even if sometimes it's not easy because we have experienced these difficulties in some places. Um, and going back to the questions in the chat. Uh, some of, uh, Christian Badu from Romania is asking if, they, if you are aware or you know uh, any study comparing the um, comparative study between the, uh, the impact from uh, hikers and bikers. Yeah, there are dozens of studies that have been performed during the past 30 years that, that look into this. Um, I, I, I've, I shared this link with a couple of people. There's a, a paper from 2001 by Thurston and Reader. If you simply Google Thurston Reader mountain bike 2001, mm -hmm. I think you'll you'll find that. Um, but that's the probably the most cited paper. But there are I've seen in the chat uh, other uh, uh, meta studies and things that have been linked to as well. So there's plenty of of ways to to get that information. Uh, follow some of the links in the chat or or Google for Thurston Reader 2001. But do you have uh, any uh, main ideas that you could share with us? 
uh, what is the main difference between the, these two impacts? The the general uh, understanding is that as long as you know, if there are, if there are <laughs> multiple visitors, it's going to have approximately the same impact. Um, there's very little change. Uh, what you do see, there are there's a, a type typology change. You could say uh, difference. Um, mountain bikers uh, typically are riding single file, so they'll be riding one after another, meaning that they have an impact on a very, very narrow section of the trail. Uh, they also have two very soft contact patches and continuous contact with the ground rather than than hard impacts from, you know, a, a hiking sole. Um, but uh, send cumulatively over the course of, of hundreds of passages, you won't really notice a difference there. Uh, the key difference, I think, really there is is the the breadth of the trail. Uh, hikers uh, typically will walk in pairs, or people will want to walk and talk to each other, uh, meaning that uh, they'll cause a, a much wider uh, path through the trail. Whereas mountain bikers will typically, uh, like I said, ride single file, following the same line, uh, causing a much narrow impact. Well, yeah. Sometimes I've seen big groups of mountain bikers in. <laughs> On, on a, on a <laughs> but I mean, I mean, um, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very practical question. Uh, what is better to build a new trail to avoid, avoid wet areas or to rather build proper drainage elevated trail bridges? If you ask me, it depends on the situation. I mean, uh, if you have difficulties, mm -hmm. if you have a place that it's full of trails, then building new ones maybe it's not a good idea. Uh, maybe forming, shaping the previous ones, maybe it's a little better if it's possible. If you have the situations with the forest departments or the public bodies that run the place, then again, proceeding them, uh, approaching them with the idea of shaping and forming, maybe for them it's a little easier than building a new one. If you have the means and if you have the allowance mm -hmm. and everything to build new trails, then. It's it's very situational again. It's, yeah. It depends very much upon uh, the specific conditions of the local area. If there's uh, you know what your budget is, what what mm -hmm. what the, the different uh, initiatives will cost. Uh, if there's existing infrastructure that otherwise uh, needs to be used, uh, existing parking areas or or public toilets or things like that. Mm -hmm. It really depends on on so many different factors that it it has to be done uh, judged on a, a space to space basis basis. You were mentioning, uh, Hans, in your, in your speech, that uh, one of the main problems is uh, that these trails are really, uh, all trails are really uh, sloppy. Too steep, yeah. yeah. Too steep, mm -hmm. too steep uh, following the, the shape of the mountain. Yeah. And the suggestion is to build them uh, perpendicular. But then what about the hill mountain bikers? All those that really like to go downhill. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, this is a, a, a common refrain, but I think uh, people don't really understand that, you know, if you've worked hard to get to the top of a mountain, you want to enjoy your trip down. When you take the fall line on a mountain bike, you're eating up all of your gained uh, elevation gain in, in, a, in an instant, and it's not particularly fun. Uh, it's much more fun to extend the ride by having a long and flowing trail that 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 takes advantage of uh, the altitude that you've gained as much as possible. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, they they believe that this is the the only uh, way to have fun on a mountain. But then once you build a, an appropriate trail, people will see that uh, that uh, following the sustainable lane, lane, line is just as fun as taking a fall line. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to open the mic. From so anyone wants to to say something, you need to raise your hand virtually. Does anyone do, do do some comments? Otherwise, okay. I will. Uh, no one wants to say anything. Uh, there are other questions. Uh, more about which uh, about social conflict. This was not. This was not the topic of the of this of this um, uh, webinar. We were really wanted to focus on. Uh, this uh, building design, but perhaps there's a way of designing these trails or the infrastructure uh, that would uh, minimize these uh, social conflicts. Do you have uh, any comment on that? And then I will give the floor to, to Rui. 
yeah, I, I did have a couple of examples in, in the presentation of, mm -hmm. for example, building mm -hmm. chicanes to, to slow down riders. Uh, other ways that you could see if, if the primary conflict is is the difference in speed between the, the users, uh, ensuring that when people, uh, when trails cross each other, that they cross each other uh, on an uphill slope, for example, so that everyone's kind of traveling at the same speed is, is a good strategy. Um, ensuring that there are good sight lines that everyone can see each other. Uh, oftentimes, you know, trails mm -hmm. are in natural environments, but they can get overgrown. It can be very difficult to see down the trail yeah. and ensuring that there are good sight lines so that people like, are expecting each other. Oftentimes, it's simply a matter of, of people not not seeing the the other user coming and and simply being scared by that. So ensuring that there are good sight lines uh, is another good strategy. OK, so uh, I'm going to give the floor to Rui Botello. Esther, can he? Um... Hello. <laughs> Good morning to all. Uh, I enter a little late because I, here in Azores we have a different <laughs> time schedule. <laughs> and uh, my question is, uh, I tried uh, to, to promote uh, downhill biking and trail biking for a long time uh, here in the islands. Uh, I also work in an NGO that protecting natural habitats in the islands. And we wanted to use that as a promoting of tourism. And as all uh, already been discussed, everyone wants a new path, a new trail, something new. And that's a, a huge conflict here in natural areas. The other thing is the type of soil that we have. So when you're we trying to design and this part of design, uh, I was already with my my hand on, on the work and trying to open new trails and uh, I was, uh, I was a downhill biker, and so I, I know a little about what we do in the in the in the trail. So my main problem here is to have a secure kind of trail that didn't do, doesn't erode, didn't destroy, continue to be interesting, and we because we have limited territory, we cannot, and that's a, a really cannot continue doing what we are doing right now that's open new new tracks so bec mainly because because we are destroying the old ones the soil is very pomitic is volcanic soil ashes so it destroy really fast we want also because in Donil we really want to go fast that's the fact so gravity is our friend uh, and what we're seeing is, yes, we use single lines. Yes, it's, it's a fact, but the, even the single lines are having a huge uh, erosion process. Then we have a conflict with someone else that used the, the mountains, and we are not discussing about them today. That is the bikers. And uh, what do you do when you have bikers? Because uh, they are the ones that going the the wrong way and uh, what i was trying and we have seen some manuals especially i think american manuals that have that uh, kind of structures that limited the entry and can be used uh, uh, do you have something some uh, some experience with that because in the fact they are doing illegally, but we don't have the like you say we don't have the fiscalization enough to be all the time in the mountain with the, with the guards, natural guards and everything. So some kind of sol uh, solutions that don't, doesn't destroy the fun of those that mm -hmm. are uh, with the bikes, but limits the problem with those that are trying to enter in a way that's not the, the supposed one. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your comment and question. Are you asking these hands? I, I assume you mean motorcyclists when you say bikers. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> not motorcyclists. So motorcyclists, this is, of course, a, a, a big area of contention because I think a lot of people uh, still today kind of m combine mountain biking and, and motorcycling as, as one in the same activity when, as we've said before, there's completely different impacts uh, between a motorcycle, uh, which has, you know, many, many horsepower uh, compared to the, to the impact that can be uh, done by a mountain bike. Uh, so it's completely different activities. And they're, you know, 
we don't we don't talk about motorcycles at all. That's not that's not our 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 uh, expertise. Uh, but we do need to ensure that that people understand that motorcycles and mountain bikes are not the same thing. That's 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 key. Um, in the, regards to your first question, I mean, if you're looking to have a tourism offer uh, that will attract you know hundreds or thousands of visitors a year uh, with downhill mountain biking, uh, you're going to have you know hundreds or you know thousands of passages on these trails per year and in that case you really do need to have a uh, sustainable uh, plan for for dealing with those and i mean if if it's going to be a sustainable tourism package i, I think you should probably look into uh you know working with one of the trail building companies that exists that that deals with uh tourism sites and knows how to to plan for that kind of uh, visitor impact so there are there are professional trail building companies that you could turn to 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 uh get advice for that um beyond that there are you know, uh, book a trail building school, uh, learn from us uh, a bit about how to uh, build trails in a sustainable way so that so that people aren't always opening new trails, uh, build one good trail and and ensure that that is, uh, or, you know, build a few good trails, but build good trails and ensure that people uh, will uh, enjoy those for for years to come. Okay, thank you. Uh, pass the floor to Stefano Belaki. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Stefano from Italy. I'm a hiking guide in a national park. And uh, in the place where I work, there is kind of a problem because um, uh, we have uh, hundreds of kilometers of uh, um, historical path that already exists. And some of them are not really suitable for bikes because they are really steep and narrow. And uh, the problem that we're facing is that uh, when we are leading groups of people hiking, we are uh, crossing uh, bikers very fast coming downhill and as the path is narrow sometimes there's kind of a problem with the people that are just walking so uh, what we can do in a place where it, we, it's not allowed to create new path and there is a lot of path that everyone can do uh, even if they are not um, created for bikers mountain bikers i mean and also another little thing we didn't talk about the e-bikes and um, i think e-bikes can be something that uh, change a bit the scenario because they are allowing people to go faster even uphill and they are way more heavier and uh, well kind of a different device to to go uh who wants to answer hans do you want to answer this this uh, question Sure, I can take this. Sure. So when he was mentioning the electric, um, we we can start bikes. with electric bikes. Yeah. I mean, the okay. studies that that exist uh, talking about electric bikes uh, show that they have moderately more impact, perhaps than, than normal normal mountain bikes, but but it's it's very marginal. So there's there's really no major difference between between the impact of mount, uh, electric mountain bikes and and normal mountain bikes. Uh, the difference, though, is that. Uh, as the activity becomes more accessible, it will become more popular. There will be more and more users. And so uh, in particular in areas that, that are maybe near to population centers, uh, you might see an increase in, in user numbers because uh, more people suddenly can, uh, can uh, enjoy mountain biking when it doesn't require the same kind of physical effort. Uh, so this is something that, that is important to keep in mind. I don't know that's anything we need to, to worry too much about right now, but it's good to have in mind uh, for the future. As far as the conflicts between the hiking groups and, and the mountain bikers, I would recommend trying to, to contact the, any kind of local mountain bike community and, and come to an agreement about which trails uh, are maybe most suitable, certain maybe times of day that are more appropriate for, for certain types of use, uh, so that you don't run into those kind of conflicts. Um, I mean, it's it's very hard for me to say I'm not I'm not part of that local community, but uh, I'm sure there are people from that local community who would be happy to to uh, have a discussion and come to a compromise that uh, ensures everyone is is happy. I'm reading the comment from uh, Nigel McDonald from Shropshire Hills. Uh, he's asking if there's been any uh, co-authored guidelines uh, promoted by the bike sector, but in, in, in cooperation with local authorities, user groups that I understand also with, with the park managers. 
Uh, if you have an answer to that, I will please to, to, to listen to it. But also, I just wanted to, to, to make a note here. This is something that um, we were thinking of uh, working together with Enos to, 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 to start a project on that because uh, co-design, as I said before, co-design, co-management, co-working is something that is demanded both from both sides, eh? from, from the outdoors sports sector, but also from the um, protected area management sector. So uh, we would like to work on a project like that. But if you, Hans or George, have already heard about this kind of guidelines, please uh, tell us. If you ask about specific guidelines that are formed between users of the mountain or forest departments and things like that. Yes, together. In uh, I mean, in Himetos, we try to do that. And this answers to the previous questions. Uh, like, we, I mean, we try to to have certain, not rules, but guidelines about how to behave in a mountain. So for example, we started avoiding certain trails in the weekends. So we know that mm -hmm. walkers go there with their families and we don't want to uh, to scare anybody. So we said, okay, during the weekends, you cannot go there. You, you, you can go there, but it's better not to. It's better to, mm -hmm. to have it this, to phrase it this way. And uh, also we said that, uh, uh, for example, we try in general to avoid the trails that have been marked as uh, the trails for the walkers. Again, not everybody will agree on that, but if you manage to take the majority of people with you, then the ones who don't will feel like a little excluded, so they start doing that also. Maybe this is an idea, yeah. but then again, this is very like, a, it's it's not for every place. You In a different place, you will have maybe set certain rules for that place. So it's not easy to have like a guideline for everything. Yeah, we are also thinking about not only uh, guidelines for how to behave or how to make the use, but also in how to design, how to uh, how to plan this uh, in, in terms of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Hans, do you have something to add? <clears throat> yeah, there there have been a number of publications that uh, I mean, Imba has had some publications in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, those aren't available uh, right now. They've they've gone out of print. Um, but they are inspired also by manuals that have existed. I, I have a quite extensive re reference library of, of a different trail building manual. So there, there is a whole body of literature uh, dedicated to this <laughs> information. It's they're generally uh, more uh, from the United States. There's a lot of, of uh, groups in the United States, the Appalachian Trail Association, the Mountain Trail Association, for example, these all are working with uh, land managers to build trails and they have uh, manuals that are available online. But beyond that, we, we have resources that we've been developing within the DIRT project, for example, that uh lay out some of these kind of principles and uh in the future we we hope to be able to to offer some some kind of similar guidelines uh but it's currently uh only digital at the, at the moment okay thank you again to give the floor for, to the last person and then we will need to to close uh, the the webinar uh max rias hi um i just wanted to quickly jump in on the problem of um the bad use of principle, like people that misuse trails or also trails that could lead to conflicts. So I think a huge aspect that um, destinations need to encourage here is basically the use of software, because a lot of people find their trails on software. So destinations have the chance of using tools like OpenStreetMap to mark trails as being not suited for mountain bikes. So software like Komoot, Strava, et cetera, can actually mark them as being not suitable. That is one good tool. And then, as we said, my mountain bike community, trail guidelines, people are actually in 99% of the cases, not really wanting to disturb nature or other, other people that use trails. So if we engage together in the, um, yeah, kind of form like a bit of community guidelines, this could be a good tool together with software. And then of course we need um, infrastructure. We need to provide infrastructure. So this infrastructure will guide them onto the right trails because it's very hard to find something else. So people will always lean towards the existing public infrastructure. Um, this also applies to e-bikes. So that was all I wanted to say. It was not really a question. 
jump in there. <laughs> but very well received your comment. It is true that uh, we need to, to take to take the make the most of all the technology and the techniques that are available there. Whereas it is digital, whereas it, it is uh, building uh, better infrastructure. In fact, I completely agree. Uh, uh, as I said at uh, the very beginning, uh, we uh, we all know because we have all experience uh, that uh, the situation is not always easy, but we, we can see that there's there's a will with uh, the, all the comments that have been here and here already in this webinar. Also with uh, our participation, uh, you know, cooperation with uh, Inos, uh, that uh, there are open doors. There are a lot of uh, ways that we need to explore more and uh, to work on that. Whereas it would be providing guidelines on how to behave, uh, on how to use the different techniques and technology to 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 improve um, the uh, experience that everyone, all visitors have in, in, in the protected areas, whereas it is uh, bikers and hikers and families. So we all agree, most of all of us, we, we, we want to enjoy and we want the protected area to um, be there and um, nice and with, uh, with, with nature. So if we all want the same, uh, I really uh, invite, all the community, the both communities, to, 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 to keep on working together. And uh, from Europark, as I said, uh, we will organize at some point, uh, probably the, the January next year, a, a big workshop face-to-face -face in, 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 in Brussels, uh, focusing on, on this topic. And uh, together, uh, we will organize it together with the uh, European Network of Outdoors and Sports. In the meanwhile, of course, we will keep on, on working on, on this. Uh, perhaps we will organize another webinar uh, later on of, in the year. And as I said, we are uh, thinking of different uh, type of projects to uh, dip more in, in, this, uh, in this topic. So thank you very much for uh, all your presence here. Uh, the video, the presentations will be available in, in our website. And uh, thank you also for all the comments in the chat. We couldn't, of course, uh, go through all of them, uh, but uh, we will uh, read them and, and pass them to the, to the speakers. Thank you uh, very much once again and have a nice week.